this morning we come and again we stop just to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and to tell you our request. But also, Father, thank you for the opportunity to hear from your word and to hear what you would say to us. And so, Lord, we, we pray that as we open your word and as we read your word, God, that you would speak, that you would move in our hearts, that you would uh, conform our minds, that you would open our eyes and our ears to, to hear your word. And not just to be hearers only, but to be doers. As we've already sung this morning, Lord, we come because we know that Christ has died for us. We know that, that Christ loves us and gave himself for us uh, to ransom us from sin and, and covers us with his blood and has forgiven us. And we also know that it's only by the power of the Spirit who lives in us that we're able to come and to, to do these things. And so we pray that you would just make us aware of that. And then also, Lord, that you, through those things, would just draw us to yourself. May you be exalted as we talk about you now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, previously, in the last episode... <laughs> Remember, if you'll remember, John the Baptist had begun his ministry. And his ministry was a ministry of repentance. It was a baptism and repentance was the declaration. And in fact, he had begun because the Bible says that the word of God came to him. In a period where no one had heard from God... As a prophet, I want to make sure that you understand there was still the Scripture available to them. They still had the Old Testament, but they were reading it. And as we'll see today, it didn't seem like it had much application to their lives. They were reading it, and maybe they even showed up for church services, but the way that it applied to their lives was it didn't. They had like a religious life and a normal life. They had their Sunday and then they had their Monday through Saturday, the two never to meet. Right? And, and, and that's, that's wrong. <laughs> we don't want to live like that. Our Sunday, our time with the Lord influences our lives. It's not just part of our life. He is our life, every aspect of our life. And so John begins to come. And remember, he's the forerunner. He's making the way straight. He's clearing the way because the king is coming. I was disappointed it hadn't happened yet. So it's, uh, um, But he's making the way straight and making it to where uh, getting people ready for the king to come. There's a, I wanted to say, there was, he's like a crier uh, going out and, and preparing the way. Um, so he does that, and as you can imagine, this is something that's, that's different. It's something that's unique. They haven't heard it in a, in a long time, or a prophet is saying, I have a word of the Lord. And so crowds become, begin to come to him, and let's read there in verse 7. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and what, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages. So we have this situation where the crowds are coming to John, and by the way that John responds to them, which is not the most... Um, politically correct or seeker sensitive way of speaking to somebody calling them a brood of vipers which we'll look at in a minute it's not the mode of evangelism we necessarily prom promote uh, here at Providence but as as he goes out the crowds are coming to him because they know God is doing something unique 
We're seeing that even today. Right now, as we speak in Kentucky, at a little Methodist school called Asbury University, there, is a, there are talks of a revival going on. Now, notice how I said that. I said talks. I said that for a few reasons. One, I am an ultimate skeptic, even though I'm trying not to be. And so I always want to be cautious. But two, it'll actually be in the days and even years to come that we know the full extent of that revival. But I will tell you, I have great hope because the words being associated with the revival are words like confession of sin, repentance, and worship. And if you want to have revival, those three things are necessary. And so I'm, I'm super hopeful that just days after the Grammys did their satanic thing, that God decided to move in a little school in Kentucky. But, brother, but what's happening is because it is moving and because he is moving there and everybody's hearing about it, thank God for Twitter and that account, this little school has people driving from all over the country coming to see what's going on there. Some of them are skeptics, like I just told you I would be. And they're, they're showing up to try to say, this isn't real. Let me demonstrate that it's not real. And they're leaving going, hey, something's going on in that place. It's just a different feel when you go in there. You can feel the, the love and the sweetness of God because what's happening is students stand up and read Scripture one after another. Then they confess that they're not living up to the Scripture. Then they pray and repent and then they worship and then they do it all over again. And it's been going on since Wednesday. They had a prayer meeting that started on Wednesday and it just never stopped. And now this 1,500 seat auditorium is continuously filled with students and with onlookers coming to say, what's going on in this place? Man, I pray that continues. I pray that spreads. And I said this morning in our prayer meeting, if it can happen in Podunk, Kentucky, sorry, I don't know the town name, but if it can happen there... Why not here? Amen. Right? Why not with us? But these crowds come and they're looking. They want to know what's going on. Everybody's got some kind of movement happening. Let me go be baptized by this John the Baptist guy too. I'll get baptized. Is that the cool thing to do now? Put me in the, in the water, right? And so he show up and John looks at him and he says, You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, what he's literally saying to them is you group of snakes. Right. And any Jewish person upon hearing that would automatically think back to Genesis chapter three. Yeah. And they would automatically be reminded that Satan is known as the serpent, as a snake. And all through scripture, we see that we even in Revelation, that great serpent of old Satan. And so he's literally saying, you group of snakes, he's associating them with Satan themselves. And that's just not a place you want to be associated with, right? I mean, especially if you're a Jew, it's, it takes you back because what is John doing? He's not trying to be rude. He's not trying to be ugly. He's not trying just to startle people for the sake of startling people. He's not trying just to be rough so that he can prove that he's manly or just trying to be stern so that he can say, ha, look how different I am from everybody else. He's calling them out because what's necessary to prepare the way for the king is to realize that our relationship is not where it's supposed to be. What's necessary for us to realize that we need a Savior is to realize that we are sinners. Now that's an important message even for those of us in this room today because it's easy for us to realize that others are sinners. But it's sometimes real difficult to realize that we are sinners. Even those of us who have been saved by God's grace and mercy and have had our sins forgiven, we still struggle with sin. And we need to be aware of our sin. In fact, even this week I was talking to someone and I said, how's your prayer life going? And they said, it's OK. I said, how's your repentance? And they said, you know, I really just don't know that I'm sinning that much anymore. And I was like, OK, so you're unaware. OK, you know, you have some spiritual blinders on because we are going through the mode of sanctification. But brothers and sisters, we have not yet achieved that glorification. There's always sin in our life that we're battling. And hear me, it's important to know that because if you're not battling sin, 
you're losing to sin. As John Owen once said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And when it comes in unaware and we're not, we're not aware that it's there is when it's the most insidious in our life. And so John gets their attention. They show up. They say, we want to be baptized. And he says to them, you group of snakes. Much like Jesus would later say, your father is not God, but or Abraham, your father is Satan. He's, he's getting their attention and saying, your sins are evident to me. I see them even though you don't. You group of snakes, who told you to flee from the wrath that was coming? Where was John before he came back to do this ministry? Where had he spent most of his life? In the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is not necessarily like we think of it. We probably think of like sand and or I don't know. I don't know what you, it depends on what, where you're at. You might think of a desert or you might think of like a, the wilderness as a big forested area with lots of bears and things like that. And you've got to survive like grizzly atoms. But, uh, but his was more the sand, right? And it was more the snakes, the vipers, they were incredibly, uh, Poisonous, but they were usually only about two feet long. And they would lay flat and often look like a stick. And they would be confused for sticks. In fact, it's told that people would go and pick up sticks, and as they picked up a stick, they would get bitten by a snake. We even have a biblical story of that, right? Paul goes out to gather firewood. As he gathers the firewood, he gets bit by the snake. Because these snakes laid flat by the wood, look like it. So what would happen is occasionally in a desert where everything's dry, fires begin. And as the fire begins and the wood begins to burn, they say you would just see steady streams of snakes fleeing away from the burning wood. And this is the picture that John the Baptist is painting with his words. Who told you to flee from the wrath that is coming? Who's telling you to run away from the fire? Because John is, is coming to them and saying to them, I don't think that you're really interested in God. I think you're interested in getting away from the wrath. I think you're interested in fire insurance more than you are in God himself. Now keep that in mind because as we go through we're going to come back and talk about that because that's a, that's a common thought even in our day to day. And I would say to you and I that it's something we need to question ourselves on also. We need to ask ourselves, am I in this just to get out of hell? Or am I in this to get glory and honor to God? The two aren't mutually exclusive. But to focus on one is usually to the, to focus on the hell part is also often to the detriment of the glory of God aspect. And so he says, who told you to, to flee? And his, his, uh, the way he asks the question suggests the answer is not me. I didn't tell you to. So what are you doing here? Who called you out to this area? And then he says, you're just trying to get away from the wrath. And so his response to that is bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He's saying, if this is genuine, if this is really what desires in your life, it's not just that you want to get away from the wrath. It's that you will also bear fruit. Isn't it interesting when we talk about repentance, we often talk about what you stop. Right. Repentance means to turn away, to do a, a 180, not a 360. We don't want to go all the way around, but a 180 and to go back, to go the different direction and to, to walk away from the sin. And even last week we said it, it's not like you continuously step on the toes and say, sorry, you get away from it. Right. We stop. But Christianity and even repentance itself is not just about what you cease to do but also what you begin to do. Because Christianity is not just about what you take off, but also what you put on. It's not just that the old man dies, it's that the new man comes to life. And so when there is repentance, you bear fruit. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You don't bear fruit to produce the repentance. 
You bear fruit because you have repentant, repented. And so we, we have this aspect where, where John is drawing attention to their lives. And he's saying, yeah, you want to come and be baptized. But what about your lives? What do your lives say about your repentance? What do your lives speak about what you believe? Are you bearing fruit? Are you doing the things that we read about there in Galatians chapter 5, where the fruit of the Spirit is alive in you? And notice there, even in, in Galatians 5, it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the believer. It's not you causing these things to happen. It's the Spirit inside of you causing these fruit to be there. And if you are a believer, then fruit will be evident. He's saying, you, you want to demonstrate that you want repentance? Live godly lives. Bear the fruit that keeps with the repentance. And don't say to me or to yourselves, we're Abraham's children. Right. Because he's saying, here's here's what I want you to do. I want you to repent. I want you to repent sincerely because you're sinners, you're sinners who are away from God and the wrath of God is coming. And so repent And the way I'll know you repent is if you bear fruit. And the Jews would hear that and say, me. Are you talking to me? Do you not know who my father is? Do you not know who my grandfather is? I can trace my lineage all the way back to Abraham, the father of our religion. Don't talk to me about repentance. I'm already in the group. Because they, they thought that their genealogy provided salvation, provided security. You know, that's not even far-fetched today. I can't tell you how many times, especially when I was pastoring in the South, that I would ask somebody, are you a Christian? Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? And they would say, absolutely. And I would say, well, how do you know that you know? And they would say, well, my grandma has been at the church down on the corner for the last 32 years. I would say, but your grandma's not you. Right. Or even one time flying back to Uganda, I got seated next to a man and you can pray for people who have to sit to, next to me on long flights. I, I consider them a captive audience. They have nowhere to go. So it's a uh, time to talk. And so um, as we were talking and the salvation came up, I asked him, I said, are you a Christian? He said, of course, I'm a Christian. I said, well, how do you know that you're a Christian? He said, I'm American. And, and even then, he's like, I, I'm American, or my grandmother went to church, or, or my daddy told me about church, or my so-and-so planted that church, started that church. Even today, we find people falling back on that. But please hear me. Other people's relationship with Christ and, other, and nationalities do not equal your salvation. Salvation is not dependent upon what Abraham did for you. It's dependent upon what you believe about Christ. The fact that your grandmother was a Christian, praise God, but you don't inherit that. You may inherit her, her ability to cook. You may inherit her ability to tell jokes, but you also inherit her sin, unfortunately. And you need Christ to come and forgive you of that. It's about the decision you make and the fruit you bear, not what others have done for you. And that's exactly what John the Baptist tells them. He says, don't tell me that. Don't tell me we have Abraham, because guess what? God can call children of Abraham from these rocks. And what another word picture, right? He's reminding them, God made Adam from dirt. And if God can make Adam from dirt, he can, rise, he can raise up more people from these rocks to praise him. He doesn't, he doesn't need us in, for that sake. And so it's not like that they can just rely on that. They must trust in the repentance that is coming. And he says, let me tell you something. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. You know, back in the day when you had to use an axe and swing away at these trees, they would begin chopping. 
And when the day was done, often the bigger trees had not been felled yet. And so they would just simply lay the axe down at the root of the tree to pick up the next day with the impending notion that the tree was going to fall the next day. Right. So the idea of laying the axe at the root of the tree is the idea that judgment is on the way. Judgment is near. The, the, the end is soon. It's coming. That final blow, that final strike is just around the corner. Are you ready? And why is he saying that? Because John the Baptist knows that he's the forerunner. He knows that as he's coming and telling them you need to repent, he's not leading them to salvation. He's simply letting them be acknowledged that they need salvation because the one who is their salvation will soon be on the scene and will soon be coming. And he's saying, you better be ready because he's coming. The king is coming. Are you ready for him? Because the axe is already laid at the root. And you know what happens to those trees when they're felled. If they don't bear good fruit, you chop them down, and what do you do with them? Uh, you make firewood out of them. He says, get ready, the judgment is coming. Are you ready? What about us? Are you ready? Should Christ return this afternoon? Should Christ return today? Are you ready? Are you dependent upon the repentance that you have in Him and knowing that He died for your sin, for your grace, uh, for, for your sin and to give you the forgiveness? Have you trusted in His death, burial, and resurrection? Or are you relying on your, your parents' relationship? Are you relying on, a, well, I walked an aisle 30 years ago. Are you, are, you, are you seeing the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Are you being led to repentance daily? Are you ready? Are you bearing fruit in keeping with repentance? And as he says this, as he says it, it doesn't matter about your genealogy. It doesn't matter about your nationality. It doesn't matter what sect you find yourself in. What matters is repentance. The, the crowds become astonished and they say, well, what, what are we going to do then? Right? What should we do? And he says to them, he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. What is, he, what is he recommending here? He's talking about compassion, right? Having compassion on people. What he's not doing, please hear me here. What he's not doing is instituting socialism. That's often used in this verse to say that because this, this has nothing to do with the government. This is not imposing and forcing people to do this. This is actually quite the opposite. It's talking about what separates us, those of us who claim Christ, those of us who claim to have been repentant, those of us who claim to have put on the new person, what separates us from the rest of the world. It's not that we're forced to be compassionate. It's that by God's grace and mercy, we naturally volunteer to be compassionate. And we begin to care for people because we love our neighbor. And we begin to be compassionate because we realize how much grace and how much compassion has been given to us. It's not about making others do it. It's about stepping up to the plate and saying, I'll do it. It's about seeing the hungry man and feeding him. It's about seeing the, the homeless man and giving him shelter. Not because you have to because of a law, but because you have to because of the love and the compassion of Christ that burns deep within you. And he says, so if you have two tunics, you give it. If you have food, you give it. You, you show compassion and you care for one another. You love your neighbor. How are you doing on that? How are you doing on, on loving your neighbor? How are you doing on showing compassion to the unfortunate. How are you doing on not saying, why don't you get a job and get your own tunic? 
and instead saying, you're cold? Let me help you get warm. You're hungry? Let me feed you. You say, well, you don't know what made them get hungry. I don't know what made them get hungry. I don't care what made them get hungry. They're hungry. Feed them. Take care of them. Show compassion for them. Because compassion's been given to you. I know what made you hungry. And I know about the bread of life who came to feed you. Despite that. He says, you want to bear fruit? You want to show the love of Christ? You want to show that you're repentant? Demonstrate the love of Christ in your life. And then the tax collector stepped forward. And you know this already probably, but when tax collectors step forward, nobody likes tax collectors. <laughs> Not, not today, <laughs> and, and definitely not back then. Tax collectors were corrupt. They were evil. They, they were instituted by Rome, and their goal was to break you in order to get rich. All right? It kind of sounds familiar, but that's, <laughs> that's what they did. And so they stepped forward, and notice, notice who's coming out. It's not just the Jews, but it's the tax collectors. And even soldiers, we'll see in a minute. The crowds are coming. They're curious. What is God doing in that place? And when the tax collector comes forward, he, he hears what he says to the Jews. He hears them say, show the love of Christ. Be compassionate. Care for others. And you can imagine that as the tax collector hears that, he thinks to himself, that's basically the exact opposite of what I do. Give a tunic. I'm the one taking the money from the people so they don't have the tunics. Feed them. I'm probably the reason why they're hungry. Because I'm extorting their money. And he hears it and the soldiers hear it. And so the tax collectors step up and they, they say to him, Hey, teacher, what about us? <laughs> what shall we do? And it's almost the same message, but it's applied to their life in a different way. Right? It's applied specifically to their situation. He says to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. What's he saying? He's saying, don't steal. Be honest. Be a person of integrity. I'm reminded of when Martin Luther uh, was preaching. Uh, a guy came up to him afterwards and said, Sir, I make shoes. I'm a cobbler. That's what I do. And I feel like I've been saved. What now should I do for ministry? And Martin Luther said, Go back and make the best shoes you can for the lowest price possible for the glory of God. Right? It's not that in our ministries, it's not that when we repent, all of a sudden we all stop and we all become foreign missionaries or we all become preachers or we all become those. Praise God if that's what happens. But most of the time what it is is we go back to the jobs and the vocations we had. It's just the way we do them is different now. We don't connive. We don't manipulate. We don't steal. We don't slander. We don't back talk. We don't gossip. We don't use people as stepping stones to get to the, to the top. We don't take advantage of situations. No, we do everything as though we're doing it unto the Lord. And we treat everyone with the dignity and the love of the Lord. And so the way that it applies to our lives is it changes us. And we go from a tax collector who stole to a tax collector who's honest. People may say, yeah, he's a tax collector, but he's actually one of the good ones. I don't know what the difference is in that guy. Maybe we should go figure it out. And soldiers also here, and the soldiers step forward and they said to him, and what about us? What should we do? And he says, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation. Be content with your wages. So as you can imagine, the soldiers were powerful men. And they would be the men who would tell you, you know, if you want a little extra protection, we can make sure that you're taken care of. If you'll just slide a little money over this way. Oh, and by the way, we can also make sure you're not taken care of. So it's your choice 
however you want to do it, long before the mafia came around, right? <laughs> you, had, you had that, or long before we could go through a long list. But and he also, by threats or false accusation, and then there's this aspect, be content in your wages. Be content. And all of these, there's an aspect of greed that's there. Wanting to keep the tunics, wanting to keep the food, wanting to, to steal the money, wanting to gain more money. So notice that the sin for all three of these groups, we might say, is the same. But the application of the repentance changes depending on the one who is being repented. Because repentance is not just some foreign idea. It's personal. It meets you where you are and it changes you. It changes not just your lifestyle when you're sitting in this room, but your lifestyle outside of this room. When I was in um, Arkansas as a pastor, a young pastor, we used to every, I don't know, two or three times a year, we would have the Gideons come and speak at the church. I, I think you're probably familiar with the Gideons. Um, and when they came, most of the time, the church was pretty receptive. You begin to realize that the stories are somewhat the same after a little bit. But, um, but you're still excited. It's a Bible ministry. Praise God for that. But one time, a guy stood up behind the, the pulpit. And I could just sense the change in the room. And they were like, ah. Oh. And he went through his thing, and I think he was actually the best speaker that we had had. Some of the other Gideons, I appreciate their passion, but they're not great speakers. And, uh, and sometimes they were a little boring, if we're being honest. But this guy was actually engaging. He was a good speaker. I was like, man, this is great. But as I looked around the room, I could tell the rest of the congregation did not think it was great. They were very irate and upset about it. And afterwards, I, I went to the deacon. And by the way, this guy, as soon as he finished speaking, I think he felt it too, because he got out. Right? He, he left. And so I went to Deacon's. I was like, what's going on? And they said, that guy owns the oil company down the street. And everybody within a two to three town radius, radius knows that guy's a thief. He charges way more for the oil. He pushes the price way up. He, he'll tell you he filled the tank all the way when he filled it three quarters of a way. All these things and said, everybody knows he's a thief and it's just hard to hear him talk about God when we all know that he's living such a different lifestyle. And that's exactly what John the Baptist is saying right here. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Look, as the old saying, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Is the walk matching your talk? And I'm not I'm not so much this morning, guys. I'm not talking about what we say about them and what them are doing. I'm asking, what about us? What about repentance in our lives? Are we bearing fruit? Are we demonstrating the spirit in our lives with the way that we treat people? Are we showing compassion? Are we content? Are we loving our enemies? Are we living lives that promote holiness? Are we being a brood of vipers? Just trying to flee from the wrath to come, but not actually having our lives changed. Not actually seeking to glorify God as much as seeking to get blessings from God. Using God to get our fire insurance while we live and do the things that lead to the fire. What about us? Are we repentant? What about you? Are you repentant this morning? Are you bearing fruit all of us in this room, I believe, claim to know the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We profess His death, burial, and resurrection. The question is, are we living like that's what we believe also? 
Not just are we saying the right things, but are we doing those things? Are we living in a way that men may see our good works and glorify God who is in heaven? Are we being reminded that by grace we have been forgiven and not by works, lest any man should boast, but through Christ, but to do the good works created beforehand? Providence Baptist Church, brothers and sisters, let's bear fruit in keeping with repentance that God may be glorified because, believe me, the King is coming. Let's pray. God, may you be exalted in our lives. And Lord, when we, when we have failed to be repentant, God, demonstrate that to us. Bring that, bring that to the forefront. Convict our hearts this morning that we would confess our sins to you and, and cry out to you that we need you. God, in our own power, we can't do it. And because of relationships with other people, we, we can't achieve that salvation. All our works, all our righteousness is like filthy rags, God. I praise you, Father, that you are so great, you are so mercy, you are so kind, that you take our filthy rags and you clothe us in new rags, in a new wardrobe. You, you put on white garments to cover up our soiled ones. Father, when we get these clean garments, when we get this new life, help us not to go back to living in the dirt, to rolling around in the mud. God, help us to see the practices in our lives that need to change. Help us to see the, the things that we do that we, we just need to stop doing and start doing the ones that would bring glory and honor to you. I don't know what that is, Lord, because even as we, we said, in each of our lives there's different applications and there's unique things dealing with every aspect of our life. So, Holy Spirit, would you show each and every one of us what we need to change, what we need to repent of. Show us the fruit we need to bear. Because our goal, our desire, is not just to get away from hell. But God, we want to be with you. And we want to honor you and we want to glorify you and we want the world to know of your great worth. We want them to adore you and to to seek after you the same way we do. Not, Not for any other reason than the fact that, God, you are worthy. You are spectacular and amazing. You're the King of kings, Lord of lords. You are the one true God. We desire you. And when we don't, change our hearts that we would. It's in your name we pray. Amen.